Wonderful. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Uh, I see attendees are popping in. That's wonderful. Uh, this is a, a meeting of the Hamlet of Beaver Creek community. Um, it is a, 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 a meeting being conducted via Zoom. It is being recorded. And it's March 23rd of 2022, and we are calling the meeting to order at 7.01 p.m. So I'm just kind of keeping my eye on those uh, attendees, and I know all of them uh, know us. So I'm not going to do any, well, I am going to do introductions because Joe Merrick, our guest speaker, doesn't know all of us. So my name is Tammy Stevens, and um, Cheryl Buchert is our treasurer, if she'll wave for me, and Joe Merrick, a director at large, if you'll wave, wonderful. Mark Hilliard, director at large, with I see his wife off to the left, Cindy Hilliard. Hi, Cindy. <laughs> Jessica Cernak is our secretary and corresponding secretary. Um, and then Jack Hip is uh, with, oh, then he's got his little yellow hand up and Jack is a director at large. And um, we're missing, well, Bill Merchant will be on, I'm sure very, very soon. He's our vice chair. And then uh, Kenny Cernak is not able, he's a CPA. <laughs> it's March 23rd. He's not joining us. Oh, so, right. <laughs> but he's a director at large. Anyway, we have our introductions and um, I'm, I'm going to absolutely launch because I happen to know this is going to be a very active conversation. This evening we have Joe Merrick with Clackamas County. He is the county's transportation safety program manager. I took that off an email. Is that still correct, Joe? Yep. Beautiful. Okay. And Joe's going to talk to us about a whole ton of stuff. Um, the Redland Road, Fisher's Mill Road plan, the intersection there. Also, I bet you've all noticed a couple new signs up on all of our roads around Beaver Creek. Joe's gonna talk about that, as well as the future next phase in making our crazy Camera Road, Leland Road, Beaver Creek Road intersection a little safer. Uh, what's gonna happen and when and who's paying for all that. And so without further ado, Joe, thank you for joining us. And um, oh, oh, one more thing before I launch. Joe sent me a PDF uh, with more information about what he's going to present tonight. If anyone wants me to email them a copy of that PDF in the chat, if you will just say send PDF and your email, I will email you the uh, file. And that's it. Joe, you're on. Thank you. All right. And it looks like I can share my screen. So let me start my presentation. Uh, Jessica's looking to make sure that you can do that one, Zach. I got a green light, so I think, yeah, it looks like I can do that. So... Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, good job. All right. all right, you all can see that. Now it moved all around on my monitors, so... This will work. All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Joe Merrick. I am the Traffic Safety Program Manager for Clackamas County. And um, I wanted to talk to you about uh, traffic safety and project updates in the Beaver Creek area. And given that I don't get an opportunity to speak with you all a whole lot, I had a bunch of other stuff I thought could be useful, little tidbits of information. So I want to talk about a new software package we are using called Vision Zero Suite uh, to do safety assessments, talk about the All Roads Transportation Safety Project, which gets into all the signs that you're seeing around the county, and then a little bit more deep dive into uh, Beaver Creek, Leland, Camrath, Redland, Fishers Mill. And also I wanted to mention uh, some uh, fixed radar signs that we've installed on Redland Road and then take questions. And probably what I'll do is after each section, I'll ask if there's questions. Um, so first of all, just a reminder that we do have a adopted transportation safety action plan that was adopted by our Board of County Commissioners in 2019. That plan calls for uh, eliminating fatal and serious injury crashes by 2035. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, and so all the work that we do um, is really motivated around that plan of trying to get to zero. And the reason the number is zero is you ask the question, it's like, okay, if it's not zero, how many people in your family do you want to die? Is it like, 
you know, 20 of your family members or zero of your family members? And when we've done surveys, most people say zero. And so that's when you take crashes, it is really down to the individual level. And that crash could be, you know, me, it could be my wife, it, it could be another family member. And we certainly don't want that to occur. Um, some of you may know that we have traffic counts online. Um, the website address there, if you just do a Google search of Clackamas County traffic counts, we have a map. We are just updating counts this year. And so probably later this year, we will have uh, updated counts. So in addition to 2002, 2005, 8, 11, 15, 18, we'll have 21 on there. So that's kind of interesting to, um, well, it's interesting to me anyway. Uh, if you're wondering, oh, how much traffic is on that road? We, we do ooh, 650 counts as part of a contract every three years. So that's that. And again, the website is on there or you just search under Clackamas County traffic counts and a link will come up. Uh, lastly, just a little tidbit. And I don't know, how, Tammy, how much you and Mike have talked about, but projects, my, my last, projects that I've put out to bid, we've seen uh, cost 30 to 70% over engineer's estimate. And that's COVID, that's supply chain issues, that's inflation, it's a whole bunch of things. And so right now, we really don't know, is that gonna come down? Is that gonna stay? Um, also, we're, uh, some contractors are so busy, we're not even getting bids on some projects. So it's making it a little bit more challenging right now for us to get projects done. So it's just kind of an informational piece. You know, if they, these numbers stay high, it means the amount of money we have isn't going to go as far as we had originally planned. And obviously that's not in our control, but it's always good to know. So um, any questions about those items? Yes, Jessica. There's the unmute button. Okay. Um, yeah, going back to your traffic counts, um, yeah. I, I found that very interesting too. Quick question there. How much of um, an input to your evaluate? So two questions there. How much how much of that is um, as, as input to which um, which intersects to intersections to focus on, roads to focus on? And the second part of that question is um, is there a relative to other areas? Like, uh, like is, is, are there those types of studies that are being done? Uh, and and what, uh, so the uh, first one, when we're looking at safety stuff, traffic volumes are factored in. Um, you know, it's looking at volumes, looking at crashes. And I wasn't sure what your second question was. Um, if, if it's compare, if, if there are, um, if that evaluation is compared to other areas within the local, area. Oh God, my it's asking it very correctly. Are, um, are you are you asking about um, more trends in traffic volumes that, that uh, we see? Correct. Yeah. And I guess how, how much like what weighting is there from one intersection to the next? And does that get involved in those in those weights? So, well in any analysis we're doing around safety, we're going to be looking at the crashes, we're going to be looking at the traffic volumes. Um, other factors we'll look at in some areas is how are the volumes changing? Like we've had a few roads around the county where we've seen like astronomical increases in volumes and then others where there's not a lot of increase. So we try to have that history um, because, you know, that can inform what we're doing. And just as an example, we were doing some work. I don't remember the name of the road, somewhere out by Sandy. And I started looking at the volume history and and um, it serves the periphery of Sandy. And so the volumes had gone way up and I was pretty surprised. And so we're like, whoa, this has really gone up. And so it's gonna kind of move it up a little bit in terms of as we're looking at things we might do because whenever we see more crashes you know, or uh, more volume, there's more probability of crashes. So we try to take that into consideration. And then with the counts we're doing now, um, we're still trying to figure out how to account for COVID. And to give an example, during the recession, we saw volumes drop as much as 30% uh, during the recession. And then they came back up and they were up pretty much back to normal when COVID hit. So we've seen another drop, but I think we're not gonna see 
Well, I'm not sure yet. We, we're still going through all the data to see how much different volumes are going to be. So that's a, that's another thing we'll be looking at because some volumes have stayed the same, some volumes have gone down. Bit of a puzzle. Does that, that kind of answer them? Yeah, it's, it sounds like they're prioritized based on um, relative rate of increase of traffic. Yeah, well, when we're looking at the crashes, we're looking at the volumes, we're looking at the crashes, and we're looking at the crash rates and the yeah. crash frequency. Volumes, excuse me. Yes. Yep. Thanks. Yep. Hey, jo Joe, yes. um, I'm going to keep my eye on our attendees. Uh, we have Amy, Athena, Barbara, and Peter, Dave, and Carla, Diane, Jeff, and Catherine. So if I see a raised hand there, I'll just kind of jump in at you know an opportune yep. time for a question. Great. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um. So, so one of the roles that one of the areas I'm responsible for is really looking at the whole safety of the entire county of all, all the roads and we've been struggling for years to find some relatively easy ways to really um, quickly and accurately assess our road network and so there's a software package we've recently purchased and started using uh, that is really focused on data driven safety management. The software is developed by a company out of Colorado called Diaxis, and the, the folks that run that company, they're actually a team of safety engineers turned software developers because they uh, had frustration with trying to fix problems at the agencies they worked for and trying to do the analysis and said, there's got to be a better way. And so they collaborated and formed this company, Diaxis, to form a software that we can use for assessing our road system. And the questions we often ask that you probably often ask as well is when we're looking at road safety, it is a matter of degree. And we're always asking how much safety is, is enough. And what that means is investment. You know, How much safety can we expect from something that we do to the roads or a change? You know, How many crashes are too many? Is, is one crash at this intersection too many or not? And um, you know, how much bang for the buck can we get out of our money? Because, you know, we don't have a lot, so we need to invest it wisely. And then oftentimes it's like, is this normal? Is this not normal as we're looking at intersections? And, and so those have always been a little bit elusive and somewhat subjective. And, and oh gosh, around two, I don't know, early 2000s, the uh, uh, document called the Highway Safety Manual was published and it was it created it created a set of basically st statistical models and equations to allow us to evaluate safety and so this software package just uses essentially the equations in the highway safety manual and again what it's doing is it's giving us a quick accurate and consistent way to look at safety on the roads and in essence, it's just taking advantage of this massive computing power we have these days and using statistical models and studies that are based on real world examples of safety improvements that worked to really allow us to look at the safety performance of our entire roadway system. And so that includes analysis of crashes and crash patterns, predictions uh, and benefits of safety, and then looking at road segments and intersections. And this can be used for the work that I do in safety. It can be used in development review, asking that question when you build that development, what are crashes likely to do? We can use it in assessing uh, uh, designs for capital projects. So a lot of use of this software. Um, Joe, just, real, real quick, Joe, uh, Jack yeah. has a, a question for you. Okay. All uh, right, yes. Um, how much factors in uh, on whether it's an appropriate speed for a certain road? I mean, do you analyze and say, you know, this really shouldn't be 45, it should be 35 or, you know, is that ever done or? Yes, yeah, that's, that's actually something we're doing darn near every day. Um, you know, we're looking at roads and we're asking the question, is this post the speed on this road appropriate? When we're doing a, any kind of safety assessment, that's one of the things we're going to be looking at. There's a whole set of state laws that we follow for posting speed. So it's not this is like picking the speed and going with it. There's a whole, in OAR, there's a whole set of procedures that outlines 
the things we look at, what the criteria is. Um, ODOT just changed, Oregon DOT just changed the speed zoning methodology about two years ago from a method that's primarily based on what's called the 85th percentile speed, which is a measure that uh, where 85% of the vehicles are driving at that speed or less, and the other 15% are idiots, and we disregard them, to something that's called more context sensitive speed zoning, where we're, we still consider the 85th percentile, but we can also look at the 50th percentile speed. But more importantly, we look at what's the roadside like? Are we going through a little village? Are we you know, on a rural road with no driveways? Are we in this dense urban area where the road's posted at 45? And when you look at the land uses, it should really be posted 30. So ODOT did a really good job rewriting that speed zone language. It's actually based on a research project that was done out of the National Cooperative Highway Research Program. And um, so that's been implemented in law. And so it is helping us set speeds that are more in alignment with our road system and usually more in alignment with um, you know, our drivers of the road in terms of what they would expect the speed to be. That answer your question? Yes, right. sir. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh, let's see. Oh, so uh, so um, we have 1,400 miles of road and about 2,400 intersections. So trying to do any kind of safety analysis is uh, one monumental task. And um, so getting into the statistics a little bit, and this is really important when we're doing this kind of work. And, and um, you know, we wanna know is if we have crashes on a roadway segment or an intersection, what's predicted, what's observed, are our observed crashes um, higher or lower than what we would expect. And so this software actually uses these, these uh, models called safety performance functions that are actually calibrated for different roadways. For example, one of the safety performance functions that we use is a two lane rural road of uh, up to 5,000 cars a day. And there's another safety performance function for a rural road up to 10,000 cars a day. And so these are statistical models that have been calibrated for this type of roadway system. And so they aid in this notion of if you have that type of road, you would expect X number of crashes. And so we can kind of measure what we have against those. And again, these are all based on studies that have been done on the safety of the roadway. So it's, we're not making stuff up. It's all based on stuff that's been done. And the, the uh, thick line here, and I know I'm diving a little heavy into the math. This thick line here is basically the, the mean of, of kind of what we would expect in the way of safety for a road. And this is average daily traffic across the horizontal axis. And this is kind of like probability on the uh, Y axis, so a bit statistical. But the important part is we call this level of service of safety and there's four zones. And basically zone one and two are, are um, safety performance functions that are below the mean. So that means these roads have crashes that are less than the mean. And then level th three and four are crashes on roads that are above the mean. And when we get into this level of service of safety four, these are areas where there's high potential for crash reduction. There's high potential for us doing something to actually bring the crashes down and so that's what all the modeling that this computer program does is essentially using. And so it's really helping us take a quick look and say, hey, this road's kind of above your, your average. You probably have to take a look at that. So we're, we're just starting this. We, did, we just got the, um, actually, we just got 19, 19, uh, 2019 and 2020 data uploaded into the program like last week. And so we're gonna be going through and basically screening pretty much all of our major arterials, minor arterials, collectors, connectors, and some locals. We, we do have some busier locals. And again, we're gonna be looking at the crash patterns, looking at intersections where we're seeing um, 
trends that, that indicate they're into that level of service safety for that, that we should need to pay attention to that. And we're basically gonna develop a full updated safety project list. And to do that, we're still gonna consider all the existing safety projects that we have on the hopper. Um, we have about 60, I think we had put together a couple of years ago, back when we were working on the, the community road fund work and House Bill 2017. But we're also gonna screen the entire network and, and develop a whole new list of projects. And they'll be grouped in kind of short, intermediate and long-term because there's stuff that's inexpensive and easy to do. Um, like the signing stuff I'm going to talk about. And then there's other things that are way harder, like, you know, tackling Beaver Creek Leland Camrath and making it into something that, that is better than it is today. And then we'll be working with Mike Besner to get all these projects programmed out. And my goal is to set it up about 10 years worth of funding because um, we do have a stream of funding, which is incredible. In my 30 years at the county, this is really the first time I've actually had a real budget to work with. So that is incredibly exciting, which also means we're making some pretty good investments in safety. So any questions at this point about the software package that we're using? I know I took you a deep dive into, uh, into math world. Um, just uh, we have many more uh, attendees, Joe. So I really wanted to quickly say again, uh, Joe provided a PDF. And if anyone would like that via email in the chat, just put PDF and your email address and I will fo forward that. So hopefully you're not all writing down everything Joe's saying because you'll have it on PDF if you would like it. Um, and then again, if you have a question, of course, uh, raise do the raise hand button. Okay, thanks, Joe. Are we ready for signage? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, all right, so all roads, transportation, safety, and this gets into all those new signs that you're seeing. So Federal Highway Administration, oh gosh, it's been probably seven, eight years ago now, launched an effort to, um, as part of their, their effort of um, towards zero deaths to, um, address roadway departure crashes, which are, are a very high percentage of crashes. In our county, they're about, I think it's 43, 44% of our fatal and serious injury crashes are roadway departure. And that means somebody's driving down the road and they, they leave their intended lane of travel. So they may go off the road to the right, they may go off to the road to the left. And so uh, Federal Highway Administration uh, provided money to the states and the states have uh, spread the money out to the locals and they've done it in what's called a jurisdictionally blind approach. And so rather than saying, well, we're giving this to the state highways and, and we're taking all of it, they said, look, there's crashes on all the roads. We're going to divvy up the funds based on where the fatal and the serious injury crashes are. So this graph shows on the state highways make up about 49% of the fatal and serious injury crashes, about 29% on cities and 22% for counties. And so They've been divvying up funds from these federal programs. That's how they've been doing it, which in my opinion is a great way to do it because we put our money where our mouth is and put it where the crashes are. And so this, this project that we're currently building is part of that effort. Um, it's a, a $1.8 million worth of signing that we're currently doing in the middle of. It'll be done by the end of June. And again, the motivation behind this is these low, low cost, low cost signing to help guide people as they're using the roadway. So, so we looked at crash history. Signing is a very good low cost safety countermeasure. You can Google Federal Highway Administration uh, low cost safety countermeasures. They have a whole section on their website that describe this program. And again, our goal, you know, we're trying to get to zero by 35. So we want, you know, these signs to help us in that effort of eliminating fatal and serious injury crashes. And the other part of this is um, the manual and uniform traffic control devices, particularly around curve warning signs, had some requirements that came out in 2009 um, with some pretty significant increases. Uh, requirements for curve warning signs, which most agencies, including ours, didn't have the money to do, and so we never did it. So there's, uh, 
you know, there's an upcoming compliance date. And so part of the effort with um, this, this arts funding is to help us come into compliance. And in terms of the signing, I mean, in my opinion, it's, it's good. You know, we, we, we want to be able to guide people using the roadway and people have bring all kinds of different skills and abilities when they're using the road system. You, know, you have the, the, the sharp 20 something that has perfect vision and great reflexes. And you have somebody that may be fuzzy headed from some medications they're taking that may have a harder time navigating the road. And we have, as I'm experiencing, you know, driving at night and the light doesn't my, my eyes don't absorb the light as good and I have a hard time, harder time seeing at night. And so we have this whole range of drivers out there that we're trying to accommodate and guide uh, safely to their destinations. And so that's real, real motivation. And again, as I mentioned, this grant that we got from ODOT, it's $1.8 million. We're installing somewhere around 2,300 signs on 1,600 signposts on 22 corridors and at 82 intersections. So this is a huge project. And the important part of this is these are low cost countermeasures. By plunking in some signs, we can see a 16% reduction in roadway departure crashes by doing chevrons and, uh, and uh, curve warning signs. You know, for adding extra signs as you're approaching an intersection, we can see as much as a 20 to 30% reduction in crashes and always stops typically um, have a reduction of nearly 50% of crashes. And then also um, there's newer technology for assessing the speeds that the curve should be posted at. Before, um, if any of those of you have ever flown an airplane or have an RV and you know there's the little bubble thing that you level it with, or if you're flying an airplane and it indicates you're lean, that's the technology we use for years for, for ball banking curves. The standards were set and there's been about three different standards over the last 30 years. We're set if it's 10 degrees, you, you post the road at this, you have somebody in a car and they're driving, they're looking at the bubble and trying to write down the speed. Kind of an antiquated way. But we've got, we've been using new um, computer equipment that does this automatically. And so we, we come back, uh, we drive the road four or five times, the computer program gets a sample, we download that into a computer and it looks at those lean angles and those forces. And then it actually provides a much more accurate way and consistent way of posting those curves. And so, one of the changes with the work we've been doing with this and uh, another project we built about four years ago is some of the curve warning signs, the speeds may go up and some of them, they may go down. And when Oregon DOT was looking at this issue of curve warning sign, I, I was on the panel with the research project for that. And the only thing they found when they initially assessed all the curve warning signs in the state, the only thing that was consistent is that everything was inconsistent. And that was part because of the methodology we had. You know, it wasn't a great method. And so this electronic ball banking is really allowing us to tighten that up. And we have, we have had some complaints about why did this, this uh, curve sign go up? It should have gone down. And we're like, well, this is a more accurate way we're actually doing it. And we knew that some signs were low and some signs were high and some signs were spot on, but now everything's gonna be more consistent. And so we create a more consistency in terms of expectation for the motoring public. And also bear in mind, those signs are for a very average vehicle, you know, cause you got, if you're, you know, Tammy, if you or I were hauling our horses, we're gonna go around a curve very, very different speed than if we're in some little more sporty car or a regular sedan. And so that's part of this, this, uh, thing we deal with is all these different users of the system, not only abilities, but the types of vehicles. Um, so this is just a map showing some of the corridors. So 22 corridors, um, 82 intersections. The lines in blue are the corridors we're doing currently. The lines in black were ones that we did in, I think it was 2017, with another project to add curve warning signs. So 
we've made some pretty huge investments in upgrading our signing. And actually, as I was looking through um, our crash data earlier this year and looking at our trending, I actually think we it may be starting to pay off. We've, as I look at our crashes compared with state highways and cities, we're actually trending down just a little bit and the cities in the state are trending up just a little bit. And I haven't had a chance to do any before and after stuff yet, particularly with this 2017 project. But I, I think, you know, I think these curve warning signs may be, may be helping, which uh, is encouraging to me. As you're out and about, you'll probably see paint marks on the road and these weird W1 dash. That's all stuff for our contractor for putting in the signs. Uh, we have one inspector here that's been. Uh, helping uh, set where all the signs go. She's been working incredibly hard. And um, we're about two thirds of the way through that project right now. So um, the questions about the, uh, the arts program in general before uh, we take a look at Beaver Creek Leland camera. Uh, also, Joe, we have a question from Barbara and Peter. If okay. You could bring them over, Jessica. I'd appreciate that. Hi, uh, this is Peter. Uh, just a quick question: Does with with respect to the data that you include in projecting uh, levels of potential safety, do you take into consideration all the construction, the new housing that's going to be going in, all the new the new access roads, and the going forward the traffic, or is it just the history of uh, uh, the experience with traffic? For the safety analysis we're doing, it's it's largely based on a, a look back in time at the crash trends, mm -hmm. and the reason we do that is fundamentally crash patterns don't change a lot. Um, you know, you'll, you'll see volumes change. There are some thresholds when volumes start going up, you start seeing different types of crashes, but it tends to be pretty consistent um, over time. And, and, and we've seen this from the work we've done with our safety action plan in terms of our top three crash causes end up being roadway departure, young drivers and speed. They might move around a little bit, you know, one's 42%. And then it goes to 44% and the other one moves, but they stay pretty consistent. I'm sorry. And the, pl and the planning that we do is where we, we the transportation planning, where we're looking ahead, we start to think about uh, build out of, of areas that are zoned for housing and whatnot, and look at those increases in traffic volumes and try to identify projects. Okay, thank you. Was there another question? All right. Jimmy, there's a question on the chat. Oh, oh, I'm very sorry. Let me see real quick. It says, is any work being done looking into dynamic speed limits technology? Oh, oh, I love that question. Um, <laughs> right down your alley. And thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Using technology to, uh, to make things safer. So Oregon Department of Transportation has a couple of projects they've done. Um, they did, so for those of you that travel 217, have probably seen the advisory speeds that they have on 217 when there's congestion. And um, there's one spot in Oregon, I believe, that they are doing variable speed limits. Um, it is allowed in OAR. We haven't done any, and we while well, we were actually looking at possibly doing more of an advisory one at a, a problem intersection we had off Stafford Road, but it's it's something that's of interest to us. We haven't had any particular uh, applications where it would be good. It's it's a bit expensive to put in because of all the sensors and stuff you have to put in, and then there's a lot of work to get the speed zoning done so that law enforcement can actually write tickets. But that's technology that's out there. And I think at some point, I wouldn't be surprised if we ultimately do use that type of technology, but very good question. Uh, thanks, Dirk. So uh, Beaver Creek Leland Camrath, our little 
our little fun intersection. So one of the elements of the All Roads Transportation Project was doing these uh, intersection countermeasures, which is really providing higher levels of signing and clarification to, again, provide hopefully better direction and better driver feedback. And the work we're doing at Beaver Creek Road, it's nothing revolutionary. We're, we're adding some striping through the corners to better guide people. Um, we're putting some delineators, which is those little white reflective posts on the northwest corner where that uh, asphalt parking lot is, try to define movements a little bit better. Because sometimes I think stuff gets a little loosey-goosey out there. And then we're adjusting some stop bars and not a lot else. We're moving around some signs. And honestly, I haven't looked at the plans in detail. I've got an engineer that developed the plans and, and, um, and a technician. So I honestly didn't take the deep dive. So it's, it's pretty minor. It's pretty minor in terms of what we're doing. It, it's a Band-Aid. Um, in terms of long-term project, I mean, we, we have a project identified in our capital improvement program calling for a roundabout at that intersection, but it, there's no funding for it. So I don't know when that will be built. Um, and when we did some paving out there, it's been a few years ago, I was working with our engineer, looking at possibly trying to do some, some paving re, reprofiling. And what we found as we got into it, it was like, you know, you, you do this one adjustment and it just drives another adjustment and that drives another adjustment. And pretty soon we're, we're rebuilding the intersection. And so it's gonna be um, one, we're gonna have to take a big bite when we go in and fix it. Probably not exactly what you wanna hear, but um, where we're at. Uh, Jessica had a question. Yes. Hey Joe, thanks for providing this. Uh, what kind of considerations have there been to making this even more safe, for example, at a bare minimum, like increasing signage around, making it very, very visible that cross traffic does not stop and uh, it gets very confusing. And then the other consideration that I'm wondering is a four way stop, right? Because then that would force everyone to stop. What, why, why isn't something like that being considered? I don't know how well a four-way stop would work there. And because the, um, I think we've looked at that over the years, the way the intersection is configured, it would be pretty hard to do that as a four-way stop. Um, just, just in terms of the geometry. Um, and the cross traffic does not stop I don't know if we're putting any signing up for just looking. Uh, let's see. These are actually the signing plans. It doesn't, it doesn't look like we're we're doing any signs like that. It does look like though we're trying to clarify some of the other movements. So what I'd probably suggest is, you know, let's see, let's see what, um, let's get the signing done that we've had, that we've had design with our, our consulting engineer and see how the intersection works. And I'm still gonna be doing some, some safety looking out there to figure out, you know, how it's doing. Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe you could do an, an always stop and I wouldn't rule it out. It, it create a lot of a con congestion. I know that. And the hard part is handling that traffic from Leland and Camrath because the intersection is, um, you know, you go up this hill and then it's slanted the other way once you get, get onto Beaver Creek Road, but it's something we could, we could look at, um. Again, I, I think I want to see how the work that we're completing now, how that performs. Uh, and Joe, Bill has a question. Okay. Bill, I think you're muted. 
I was, thank you. Um, that's a couple of comments. Actually, one of the problems that I have seen through this intersection is that on camera throw, you can see the higher speed limit from before the intersection. And a lot of people who are going south on Beaver Creek and heading south on camera see that higher speed, speed limit and step on the gas through the intersection to get up to 45 through the intersection. So one of the suggestions I would have for you is to move the increase in speed limit on both Leland and Camrath further away from the intersection. Because both of those, um, you can see the speed limit increase on both of those roads from the intersection and people don't think, oh, I have to wait till the sign to speed up. They speed up when they see the sign. So having those speed limit increases a little bit further away from the intersection might calm the speed through the intersection a little bit. Yeah, we can look at that. Wonderful thing is when people are going south on Beaver Creek and turning uh, west on Leland, they're cutting through that little uh, uh, parking lot that's sort of there on the side, which isn't really very well maintained. And uh, it's, you know, nobody, nobody's baby, so everybody sort of ignores it. But it's also because of the power pole right there at the intersection, it's really vital that people who are going south on Beaver Creek and turning west on Leland be able to cut through that. If you take your horse trailer and you wanna go on Leland, you can't go around that uh, power pole. There's no way to go up to that power pole and turn right to go west on Leland. So there needs to be some sort of, I don't know, warning you know, red lines, yellow lines, something that says, watch out, going through this little piece of parking lot can be dangerous because if you go, if you're turning, again, if you're going south on Beaver Creek, turning west on Leland, and somebody from uh, going north on Beaver Creek comes through the intersection, they may not see you pulling out ahead of them before they're starting to go run in, right into you there on Leland. So it's, that's just a really hazardous place that we need to make sure people slow down as they go around that corner. If you're hauling your horses, of course, you're gonna slow down. But it's, it's just one of those things that isn't marked, isn't signaled, isn't anything. And the other thing that uh, was mentioned before, people who are coming, people who are not familiar with this intersection, who are going, east on Leland coming up to it, don't necessarily know that the people coming south on Beaver Creek don't stop. And there's you know, a, a real hazard that people who come to a stop sign and sort of they can see a stop sign signal across from them. So they might think that you know by seeing the backside of a stop sign, that's a stop sign and other people are gonna be stopping as well. They may not, uh, Ad adequately read that intersection, they may think that it's a four-way stop when it isn't and pull out into the intersection into oncoming traffic from south, going south on Beaver Creek uh, or going north on Beaver Creek from uh, Camrath. Both of those directions, both Leland and Camrath don't know that the traffic, who the through traffic is not stopping. Yeah, and, and and we'll we'll see how it does after we make these changes. When are those changes expected, Joe? Sometime between now and June thirtieth. And uh, another request we have heard is coming uh, again. Beaver Creek southbound into the hamlet. Um, is there a chance of getting one of those wonderful little signs like Redland has? You know, speed is thirty five, and you're going fifty eight, sort of thing. So. How, how do we get on the list for one of those? Um, I can add you to our list for the signs. We, we, there is a pretty long wait. Like more than a week? No. <laughs> it's, it's like a year. Oh, oh, ouch. Yeah, that's a very, so we have, we have, a, we have about eight uh, temporary radar signs we move around the county. 
and uh, it's a very popular program. And so we have a long, long wait list. And we, we had a little bit of a lag last year because of lack of staff. We just couldn't, couldn't get them moved. Uh, How much do they cost, Joe? They cost, um, well, they, uh, the, the sign itself costs about $7,000. And then uh, these are ones we, we put in temporarily. And then, uh, and actually I'll be talking about some permanent ones at the end of the presentation that we did out in Redland. And so I can cover that. So we do have a permanent program right now that we've just started, we started it last year to put in permanent ones. So, um, and that one's, we've only done a, we've built two on Redland Road. We have three in design right now. Wow, great. Um, hey, Joe, we've got uh, from Amy uh, on chat. Um, I recommend a sign on camera traveling north saying cross traffic does not stop. I nearly got into an accident there. So yeah, we're, we're going to we're going to see how the improvements go that we have okay. already designed and will be okay. built soon and then we'll make adjustments as needed. Okay. And Mark uh, Hilliard has a question. Yes, uh, along the same idea. Um, how do you evaluate when you're looking at those to evaluate what the signs are doing? And I asked the question, if, if we're basing a lot on lagging trends like crashes, then uh, when we're working down there doing improvements to the park or to the signage that we have for the hamlet and the Beaver Creek, we see multiple, multiple, multiple near collisions, near misses on a daily basis at that that intersection. That's my question. So, so the only data we can use is, use is data we have. So we have crash data. Oregon Department of Transportation maintains that data, and that's the data that we use. We we can't we can't use data of something that almost happened or could have happened. We have to use data that we have factual information on. Okay. I think I don't see any other questions. Are you ready to chat about Redland? Yep. Oh. I'm sorry, I talked too quickly. Um, Bill had another question. You're on mute. I just want to know if you've got any updated traffic counts around the Beaver Creek area, because I know we'd all like to see the traffic counts. I've seen a lot of rubber hoses across the road. So I assume that somebody is getting traffic counts. Yep. Um, at the very start of the presentation, I mentioned that we are currently updating our traffic counts and this website uh, has the information. Well, it doesn't have the 2021 counts, but we'll probably get those um, uploaded into this website this summer. We have a contract that I think they're gonna have all the counts done by poo -poo May. So it'll take us a couple months to compile all that data and upload it. So we will have we will have updated counts. That's wonderful. Great. Thanks, Joe. So moving on to Redland Fishers Mill. Our beloved little Redland Fishers Mill intersection. So um, so this one actually I, I use this new software to do some analysis at it. So I'm going to take you another deep dive into safety world here. So, um, so basically for Redland Fishers Mill, I'm looking at the crash types we have, and this is data from 2014 to 2020. Um, looking at the crash types, not a lot of surprises. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Fair number of broadside crashes, fair number of approach turn crashes, fair number of rear end crashes. And obviously, you know, we've got people turning from Fisher's Mill onto Redland that are getting hit, people turning from Redland onto Fisher's Mill that are getting hit. So not a big surprise there. Time of day, as you would expect, more around the peak hours or the busier times. The graph on the left, this shows time of day and the number of crashes. So I think the, so, you know, being out there in the middle of the night's good. There's a nice gap between 11 and 12, and then you see, you know, kind of that AMP 
that afternoon and PM peak, which is usually around school and or sh people getting off their shifts and then regular time of day is always interesting to look at too. Sundays doesn't seem to be a real great day. Monday, Tuesday, not bad. And it kind of picks up. These are a little bit random, but this is some of the stuff that we normally will look at when we're looking at intersection, because we're always saying, hey, is there any, is there any pattern here? Is there anything going on here that's, that's um, you know, unique or kind of lead us in, in one direction to do something? And so I mentioned this whole level of service safety, you know, these quadrants. And so when you look at the overall safety performance, we're in this area where there could be, uh, we could be benefit from some improvement for crash reduction. This is overall, this is fatal and serious injury. We're just a little bit into this quadrant four. And so that says, hey, there's some, some potential for, for crash reduction at this intersection. What might we do? And we have done some stuff out there. We made a number of signing adjustments. We lowered the speed and we've put in these fixed radar signs out there. And then with the arts project, we do have some other work and I've got a little sketch of that. We can look at the overrepresented crashes and that's the beauty of this is we can look at, you know, these crashes that are overrepresented statistically and that's gonna tell us, hey, this is, there's more of these than there should be. And so in this case of this intersection, our broadside is overrepresented. Our rear end crashes are a little bit overrepresented, and then our approach turn crashes are overrepresented. So it's like, okay, these are the areas that we want to be thinking about in terms of what could we do to reduce crashes for those types of movements. And so, again, just using the software, because we can do this economic analysis. So I can say, hey, what if I added a left turn lane on Redland Road? What would that do? And I can crunch that through, I can put an estimated cost in and actually calculate a benefit to cost ratio. So that's one of the really powerful parts of this software is we can do that assessment. But in addition, we can look at these safety countermeasures and we can look at what kind of crash reductions might we get for this particular countermeasure. And so I looked at, well, what if we put in an always stop? And it's like, well, always stop if it costs 50 grand, which I doubt it would, you know, we got a benefit to cost ratio of 75. It's like, dang, that's pretty good. You know, so maybe that's something we should think about. And then I just for grins and giggles said, what if we built a roundabout for $5 million there? And we got a benefit to cost ratio of one. And so this is the kind of things we can do with uh, Vision Zero Suite. And so what's really exciting is I can do, and some of you remember the road safety audit that some of you participated in on um, Beaver Creek Road. Basically, that project costs something like thirty or $35,000 to do that road safety audit. Using this software, I can do the equivalent of a road safety audit in about 20 minutes. And so it's pretty, pretty, pretty darn uh, amazing and actually really exciting because it means you know, for the same amount of money, we can get a lot more done. Questions about any of that before I dive into our little minor changes at Fisher's Mill? So rumor had it, it was a roundabout. That's really not what's going to happen? No, yeah, I mean, we don't have funding for it, you know, and so the challenge I have to do is, you know, I have like Beaver Creek, Leland, Camrath, or this one's a good example is, we have volumes increasing over time, risk increases over time. And at some point it's like, okay, we got to do something here. You know, so what do we do? Well, we don't have, you know, $6 million to build a roundabout. So what am I going to do in the interim? So I'm always faced with this notion of back to how much, you know, how much investment are we going to make into safety and what can we do with the money that we have? And, you know, for, a lot of the county, as we're coming out of COVID and we're seeing the volumes pick back up, you know, we, we have a, we're doing a really good job making investments in our system, but we've never been able to keep up. You know, we've, we've got rural roads that, you know, when I started working here had 1500 cars a day on them and now they have like 11,000 cars a day on them. And we, we haven't done anything to improve them other than keep them paved. And so when you add that many cars, it's like, okay, we, we've got to start thinking about these, 
you know, we need to have shoulders on these rows. We need to have, um, you know, better vertical alignment on the roads because you, you know, you drop into the dip and there's a whole bunch of driveways you can't see. And so that's a big challenge right now that I see, particularly in the, these, these roads that are, are these urban fringe roads, which, you know, the, the, I'd say Beaver Creek Road from Beaver Creek on in is kind of that. You got pretty high volumes. And so we're always shifting saying, okay, what can we do to this? You know, cause we, you know, so uh, anyway, I'm babbling here. So Redland Fisher's Mill, kind of like Beaver Creek Leland Camera, we're making some pretty minor adjustments. We're moving a stop bar. We're gonna add some signing, but we're trying, we've got some field fit stuff we gotta sort out. Trying to do a little bit of delineation for uh, guide people a little bit better because it's on a bit of a skew, which can, can kind of catch people off guard um, and make it a little hard to turn. So again, pretty minor stuff. Um, you know, this is another one, you know, if we continue to have crashes, we'll have to do something else. Um, you know, and looking at that always stop, if you can keep people from cutting through the gas station and might be a good solution. Um, the, the other thing I think is really important is we're looking at this, this goal to get to zero by 2035. It's really causing us to, to take a, a, a much bigger lens on safety and things that perhaps I wouldn't have done, you know, 10, 15 years ago in terms of changing traffic control or doing certain things. We're like, no, we need to do this. And Things like always stops, you know, we've had pretty good experience with those. So I, I envision more of those. Um, we have a whole long list of roads that we wanna look at trying to reduce speeds on. We're actually taking over speed zoning authority later this year from, from, from ODA. We're one of two counties in Oregon that will begin to do the speed zone investigations ourselves, um, still still working with ODOT, still following ODOT's rules, but, um, you know, we can, we can get them done a little bit faster. Um, and so I'm excited about that because I think it's going to allow us to, you know, do some better work with, um, with looking at speeds around the county and trying to get speeds a little bit more consistent. So, I mean, we have a, just a, a pile of safety work that we want to do. Questions about um, this, this other um, head scratcher intersection. <laughs> I'm not seeing any from our attendees or on chat uh, okay. board. Wow. Wow, you're really getting rather thorough there, Joe. Joe. <laughs> and then the, the last thing I wanted to bring up, because some of you have probably seen these, is in Redland on each side of downtown Redland, downtown in quotes. Um, we constructed some fixed uh, radar signs. They're AC powered. Um, we've had kind of poor performance problems with solar. We just don't have great weather for it. And um, unfortunately, they're not inexpensive to because you got it. And the big cost is just getting them, getting power to them. But we spent about eighty thousand dollars on these two signs. Uh, we turned them on in the late fall. Um, we have three other signs in design right now. One on. 282nd north of Highway 212, one on Stafford Road. No, to, well, they're, they're, they come in pairs. So a site on 282, a site on Stafford Road. And I can't remember exactly where on Stafford. It's south of I-205. And we're going to do some on New Era approaching Central Point. And then um, I haven't, part of what we're going to be doing when we do this uh, network screening, we'll probably be looking for other locations to, to, cause it's basically a program and I'm going to hopefully have enough money to do, you know, a set of a year. Well, you can certainly add us to that list. Yeah. That I figured be... you, I figured you guys might be interested in that. Oh, just a little. That'd be great, Joe. Thank you. Cool. How about questions? Anyone else for questions for Joe? Oh, and uh, Joe Matteo. Do you know anything about the um, uh, 213 um, Tolliver? Um, I'm hearing rumors of a roundabout. Yes. Those are correct. 
soon or? And, and for anyone who is not familiar, if you're going south on 213 and just before you get into the Blackman Corner intersection, the Les Schwab, the, the big road with the blinky yellow sign is Tolliver. Um, that's a good question on time frame. I, oh, we are, I believe ODOT is working on the design right now. I don't know when it's going to be constructed. And I do believe that the funding is still working out that they are going to build a roundabout. I, I remember there was some question, but I, I think that's still accurate. And if you guys need for sure, I could look, or there might even be something on ODOT's website. If you go to ODOT Region 1 Projects, they have all their, they've done a pretty good job listing all their projects on their website. Great. Thank you. Yeah, and they're all, well, actually, and they're also, um, and you know, I, I don't get to talk with you all that much. I got all this. There's another project we are working on with ODOT to put a roundabout in where 211 takes off from 224 and goes to Sandy. Mm -hmm. ODOT's looking at putting a roundabout in at that location, and we're putting a signal in at 224 in Amsager. I'm sure some of you travel up that way from time to time. Definitely. That's a, that location is a great idea. Uh, Mark yeah. Hilliard, you have a question? Yes. Uh, on uh, Beaver Creek there with uh, Leland and uh, Beaver Creek Road there at the intersection, uh, next to the park, there is a, I mean, talk about uh, shoulders, there is no shoulder between Leland and the the rail fence at the corner park there and it's about a hundred feet of about two feet deep uh, ditch where uh, the culverts that go from the east side of beaver creek to the west side of beaver creek and then travel along uh along leland or uh, and uh, on the north side that's dangerous to pedestrians that are trying to walk along there and the asphalt is crumbling away at the fog line and starting to take over the fog line. Is so there... I'll, turn in, I'll turn in a request to road maintenance on that to have them look at that. Great. Yeah, that basically that's what I was wondering about the process and how we can help road maintenance get something done with that. Yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll uh, talk to the supervisor and tell them about it. Great, thank you, Mark, for bringing it up. That's uh, uh, that is very dangerous. The white so, line, like in the ditch. <laughs> so how far how far down Leland from Beaver Creek is it? It's right there at the intersection and travels about a hundred feet uh, west on Leland from that intersection. Okay, and it's on right Leland, correct? correct? It's on yes. Leland, correct? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll pass yeah. on the road. North supervisor. north side of Leland. North. Okay. Yeah. And uh, and that property that property is owned by the county. Okay, I'll write myself a nasty letter to fix it. <laughs> With a high priority. <laughs> right. um, I see that Jessica Cernak put on chat, I think it's the link to ODOT's projects that you mentioned, Joe. Thank you, Jessica, very, very much. I'm not, I'm, well, hopefully Tolliver's on there. Okay. I didn't look at it, but. Okay. Yeah, that's the link to Tolliver. Oh, that is the link to Tolliver, wonderful. Oh, great. Um, so a question from Catherine, how does a road get a speed limit sign? Uh, you usually call us. Yeah, we have, so when you look at roads in the county, um, some roads, um, let's see, how do I best explain this? So currently the law changed ooh, three, four years ago and put an umbrella of speed limits on all roads across the state. Uh, whereas it used to be what was called basic rule speed. And uh, the basic rule speed was you drive reasonable and prudent not to exceed. And it was 55 miles an hour was the default. So we still have some roads that don't have a speed posting, but now with speed limits, <clears throat> technically we need to have all of our roads posted, which is something we're slowly working on. But if there's a road and, and there's no sign on it, 
um, you can you can uh, use our road concerns at clackamas.us and and email and then that will that will get to my crew and we'll look at the road for posting. Similar, if you want a, a speed reduce, you, you can just send an email to road concerns at clackamas.us and just say, hey, I live on you know X road and could you look at the possibly reducing the speed and then we can look at those. Um, and Bill has a question, Joe. Uh, actually, Joe just answered my question because on um, Henrici Road, it's 40 miles an hour. And then just before you start heading down the twisty turns on Henrici, it says end of speed control. And everybody says, okay, well, speed into the concern, into the turns. And I just want you to take away the sign that says end speed control. Yeah, and when we put in those signs, we were required to put those in by ODOT. So sometimes we don't have a choice. It's actually state law. Yeah, well, it's once, once you get a chance to look at it, you can't go more than 30 miles an hour down those twisty turns on Henry C. Right. So increasing from 40 to 55 to going down the turns is not going to work. Well, well, in speed zone doesn't mean you go up to 55. Well, a lot of people think it does. Now, I understand that, but, but the way the law reads is you still have to drive reasonable and prudent. Yeah, yeah we, but, we, can't, we can't fix everything. You know, I don't control right foots yet. <laughs> I, I, keep, I keep asking, but I haven't been given that authority. And Cheryl has a question. <laughs> um, many GPS systems, I, I don't know, I'm not gonna say all GPS systems, but I know that many GPS systems will tell you what uh, the speed limit in the area is in which you're driving. Um, is that pretty much accurate? It's pretty good. Um, yeah, I mean, I have a GPS system in my car and it, it, it's, it's pretty accurate. I'm not sure how they get the, the data. I imagine, you know, if they collect the data every couple of years, it's going to be reasonably accurate. But if, if you make a change in a speed zone, it's not like we report it to the, uh, to Google, you know, so they're going to have to pick it up when they do their next drive and I think what they use is, is a, like artificial intelligence software to read the signs and then that goes into the whatever application if it's Garmin or Google or whatever you're using. Great. I, I wouldn't rely on it. <laughs> All righty. We'd be explaining uh, right, that one to the police gonna, officer. <laughs> get ready to wrap this up. As you can see on the screen, there's uh, Joe's information, but he also shared some general email address for if you have some requests, you know, road signs or or roads that need attention. So, yeah, and, Joe, and that ro that road concerns at Clackamas.us, you can use that for most any request related to a road and. The person that looks at those emails will route it to the appropriate person. So it's a it's a good it's a good way to access us, and then those get put into our complaint system, and so that means they don't go away until till they're fixed. They stay forever. So 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 they don't get lost. I guess is my point. Okay, and I've got road concerns at clackamas.us, correct? Yes. Okay, I just threw it on chat. Perfect. All righty, um, Joe, thank you. Clearly, we need to have you back, uh, you know, at least once a year and get us up to speed on what's going on out there. Thank you. This was so helpful, so informative. I really appreciate it, as we all do. So thank you. Yay. All right. Thanks. And Great. feel free to, to, to ping me when you, you know, are have stuff and I can you know, because we, we do have a lot going on, which is yep. exciting. We, we absolutely will. We really, really appreciate this. And we'll hopefully see you again soon. All right. Thank Alrighty. you so much. And let me right. stop my can you share. Can you put our screen Thanks, back Jim. to normal? <laughs> yes. Great. Uh, All right. Okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and move on, Joe. Thank you again. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, our social media director, uh, Diana, had- Thanks, Joe. Yeah, take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye, Joe.
um, had requested um, that we see if we could get Lieutenant Mendoza or, or someone hopefully to talk about those of our citizens that are houseless and, and what's going on. And so I did spend the last couple of weeks touching bases with the county. I found the right person. And this is the person in charge of homeless uh, citizens. And, and the reason it's not just the sheriff's department is because uh, it, it takes a lot of government agencies and other agencies to support homelessness. That is sheriff's department, health, housing, and human resources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We do have the gentleman in charge, uh, Vahid. Uh, unfortunately, he just couldn't make it tonight. So we're going to try somehow to squeeze him in next month. It may be an hour and a half of guest speakers, which I think we would all appreciate hearing not only the services uh, that are being provided to our homeless folks, but also maybe ways that we can help too. So I apologize to Diana, and I, I just wish we could have had that happen tonight, but we just couldn't. So that will, and I see that we don't have Lieutenant Mendoza, so we're going to move right along uh, with public comments or questions. And these would be questions or comments not on the agenda. If any of our attendees have um, something they want to bring up, raise your hand. Otherwise, we'll launch. But if you do think of something later, we always love hearing from you. Okay, um, I'm going to move along. I'm not seeing any hands raised. We have actually five land use applications. All of the applicants were invited, but none of them are uh, really earth shattering. And I don't see any. Oh, yes, I do. I think Scott is one of ours. So uh, yes, Scott's here. Great. Scott Salisbury is one of the applicants. That's wonderful. Okay, let's move into our very first application, please. That Z088-22, James and Connie Hicks at 22876 South Highway 213 in Oregon City. Their property is zoned exclusive farm use. They're on 19.77 acres, and they are requesting the renewal of a temporary home for care. We received the application and uh, have gone through it. Uh, it has been both by the county and, and me deemed complete. Everything we need is there. I would like to mention that we have not received any questions or complaints and so, uh, or notes of support, just um, no communications whatsoever, but they're requesting to keep their temporary home for care in order to support a family member in need. So does anyone have any comments or questions regarding this application? And if not, I would entertain a motion, please. I move that we support this um, uh, Z, uh, shoot, I can't see the number. I move uh, that we support it. Very good. That would be Z0088-22. Very good. So uh, Joe uh, made a motion to support the application, and I didn't catch who seconded. Was that you, Bill? Or Mark. Thank you, Mark. Good. Okay. Yeah, I, I know the situation, and it's great. Okay. It's needed. Very good. Good. That's very helpful. All right, if there are no further discussions, what we will need to do, are you ready, Jessica? <laughs> okay, in the chat, if you will please put, um, actually, if you put the number Z0088, and then uh, either vote in favor of the motion to support the application, or you can type up either in favor, opposed, or abstain. And while you're doing that, and Jessica's getting those numbers, I will ask the board to vote. So if you are in favor of this motion, board, would you please uh, use your raise hand feature or just raise your hand? Okay, uh, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, unanimous for board, but we want to give Jessica time to um, receive all the chats from our attendees. Six, zero, zero. Excellent, okay. Good. <laughs> very, very clever voting on the chats is great. <laughs> Z-O, yes, 8-8. Eight, eight.
Just let me know, Jess, when you're ready to move along. I see seven in favor. Okay. Very, very good. Seven in favor. There were no oppositions or abstain abstentions. No. Okay. That is correct. Good. Sorry. I don't know what was going on. <laughs> That's all right. No, just take your time. All right, let's go on to our second application, which as I mentioned, the applicant, Scott Salisbury is with us. This is for Z0078-22, Scott Salisbury applicant at 17400 South Henry C. Road in Oregon City. The property is zoned RRFF5, they have 10.24 acres and they're requesting a partition to five acres each. And so it being zoned uh, five acre and they have 10, this would make sense. Um, I did review the application. Um, they went through a pre-application conference, which is kind of making sure all the ducks are in line and all the questions are answered and all the materials provided. And it looked like that went through with clear sailing. And so um, would you Jessica bring Scott over and uh, Scott, if there is anything that you would like to share or bring up or anything, we always appreciate our applicants joining us. Are you there? I believe so. Can you hear me? I can now. That's wonderful. Hey, Scott, thanks for coming on board. Um, yeah, no problem. How was the pre-application pre conference? How'd that go? Good. Good. Good, good. good. Yep. And you, it looks like soil and water and power, everything looked like it was in line and ready to go and any problems? No, ma'am. Everything was uh, checked all the boxes and it's all good to go. I did. You, I saw a lot of boxes checked. I do <laughs> see that Bill Merchant has a question for you. Uh, it's not so much a question, it's, okay. it's a comment on the, um, the, Agenda says this is a patrician rather than a partition. Oh. <laughs> so just wanted to make sure that everybody understood, although Scott may be, you know, a very fine guy, patrician is not quite the right word. No, it's not. We're going to have to change your application. Sorry, Scott. Yeah. Good luck. yeah. <laughs> Sounds like an attorney there that caught that. <laughs> oh, we always count on Bill to thoroughly check our stuff, but uh, no, that would be my fingers going a little too fast. Sorry. Uh, all right. Well, unless you had anything else in order to share, Scott, we can certainly entertain a motion. Nope, I'm good. Oh, wonderful. Thank you again for joining us. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Uh, Bill has his hand up. So I'd like to make a patrician motion to uh, recommend approval of Z0078-22. Wonderful. And a second? Second. Second from Joe from the coast. Okay. Any further discussion? All right, you're ready, Jess? All right, here we go again. In the chat, if you would add Z0078 and then either I, nay, or abstain. And then board, if you will raise your hand, whether if you're in support and one, wonderful, we have a unanimous as well. Okay. And Scott, don't forget to vote for yourself. <laughs> oh, okay. Is it raining at the coast, Joe? It was shortly ago. It quit again. Okay. Good, good. Scott, can I get a confirmation that Rave's tan means one thing or another? Uh, I guess that was a, a yes on the vote. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. All right. Well, you have a good evening. And again, um, I mean, I hope you stay with us this evening. And thank you again for joining us. Yeah, thank uh, you. Jessica, uh -huh, thank you. Are you close? Uh, five, excuse me. Ah, <laughs> yes, okay. I'm close. <gasps> so one abstain so far. And oh, oh they're still coming in. Okay, okay, it's fine. Take your time. Six. Six in favor. Uh, very good. Got it. So six zero one. Correct. 
Okay, got it. Thank you. All right, I'm going to move along to our next application. You, you did get, Jessica, that board was unanimous six. Okay, very good. Our next one is, yet again, another uh, request for renewal of a temporary home for care. This is Z0076-22, Donald and Teresa Grice at 15585 South Karis Road, Oregon City. They're zoned RRFF5. They're on 5.67 acres. And a kind of the same thing. I don't really need to repeat. It's thorough. Everything that's needed is there. And we've received no input. So unless um, anyone has raised their hand, if they have questions or comments. All right, I would very much uh, entertain a motion. I move that we support, um, what is it? Z0076-22. Um, that's the one. Thank you, Joe, very much. Do we have a second? Like Amy has seconded. Oh, wonderful. Amy, thank you so much for seconding. Perfect. Okay. Um, again, any final comments or questions? Here we go again, Jess. <laughs> if you all would put Z0076 in the chat and a yes, a no, or an abstain, and Joe has a question. Oh, oh. Oh, you don't oh, we're doing in favor. Okay, and for the board, please raise your hand if you are in support of the motion. And Jess, great. We uh, again unanimous six zero zero, and then we will see with our members. Okay. I count nine affirmatives. Oh, wonderful. Okay, nine zero zero. Yes. Very good. I got it as well. Good. Thank you, Jessica, very much. Boy, we do work you hard. <laughs> um, and uh, Tammy, I'd like a uh, amendment to the zero zero seven eight. There was a last minute vote, so I have I count seven affirmative. One of oh, I'm sorry, a seven. Very good. Okay, got it. Thank Thanks. you. All right, that makes a little more sense with the number of. Um, uh, guests that we have. Okay, the next one. Um, this is one that has me very baffled. This is Z056121. The property owner is Roger Roland and Desiree Barber. The applicant is Lindsay Jones. It's at 2103 South Ferguson Road, Oregon City, zoned RRFF5. They are on a half an acre. And they're requesting the reduction of a 30 foot setback to 10. Now, <laughs> their address is on Ferguson. And any land I've ever dealt with in Clackamas County, you have a 30 foot variance from the road, your front road, where you have ingress, egress, and then 10 feet all the way around your home. And I've read this application and it makes absolutely no sense to me why they're, even though their north side of their property is off of Wilson Road, that is not their ingress egress. And they're asking for a 10 foot setback off of Wilson instead of a 30, which it shouldn't be a 30. Going through the application, th that statement was actually made. Not sure why we have to apply for this. It should be a 10 foot but they had to apply for it. So <laughs> I am very confused by this. So if we can all picture it's the property right there on Ferguson on the north side of them is the Wilson Road, but it's the Wilson Road that's a dead end. It goes back to some flagship uh, flag properties and they would like to add a bedroom and a bathroom and it would put them just 10 feet off of Wilson instead of what is now there at 30. And uh, I, like I said, I've, I've read the whole thing other than this is just confusing to me why it's being required. Um, it looked, uh, they, they've actually were able to cite several homes in that area that 
also had additions that were built within the setback and must have gotten approval and stuff. So they had some good examples of what they're asking for that's already been done. And we have received no uh, complaints, questions, nothing like that. So does anyone have any questions or concerns or? Okay, I would very much entertain a motion. Come on. Oh, and Barbara has a question. Yay. Actually, it's or Peter. Peter. Or Peter. Sorry, Peter. Peter. Have, have either of these people talked to anybody on the board about this? No, 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 no. We just got the application. And, you know, just because I have some land use experience, well, I was baffled from the very beginning why this application was had to be filed. So, no, nobody called us. And I did reach out to them, emailed and asked them to join us. Um, you know, honestly, when I saw our initial attendee list, I'm dead certain there was a Desiree. So maybe they joined us but couldn't stay until this late. So I'm kind of wondering if that might have been it, but I don't have an, and like I said, within the app, um, they are questioning why they're even doing this. So can, can we and, put this off? Say again? Can we just put this off if they really want to, you know, engage with us about this, just put it off to the next meeting? We, we cannot. Unfortunately, uh, the, the input was due from the community on March 15. Mm -hmm. I did talk with the, or emailed with the planner, Andrew Yaden, and he did give us uh, a delay until tomorrow to get any community input submitted by then. So if we're going to submit anything, it needs to be like right now. And um, I mean, mm -hmm. Whether they're required to do this or not, the question is, are we in support, of, in support of the application? And we have a question from Mark and a question from Bill. Peter, did you have another question? Oh, I, I did. Okay. I, I couldn't understand part of what you said earlier. Did you say other neighbors had similar extensions um, 10 feet from the road? Yeah, yes. Uh, it, now, I don't personally know of them. It was cited in the application. I believe they cited three separate addresses that there were uh, additions added to homes that would have put them between the 10 foot and the 30 foot. So okay. um, that, you know, I just wanted to note that because apparently they had done their homework and that's always a good idea. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're, you're welcome, Barbara. Thank you for the question, Peter and Barb. And Mark, your question? Um, I'm just as baffled about this as you are. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure where the rule lies that the county would say, you know, where is your egress? You have to have the 30 foot, or you have to have the 30 foot on Wilson, but that's not your egress. Mm -mm. So and their address is Ferguson. So again, that's your kind of proof in the pudding. Right. So I'm kind of thinking that it's a matter of, uh, unless the county wants to clarify, mm -hmm. there should be, we have no position. Well, and, um, and I talk to Andrew all the time. I might just ask him because I am very curious about it. And Bill, you have a comment? I was just going to point out that we do not need to have a uh, uh, a motion and a decision to recommend or deny this application. We can simply be silent on this application. Right. We can. I always like to provide any input to the county that we can. I mean, they look toward us and, and, and Andrew did wait a, an extra week to get something from us. Um, my feeling is they shouldn't have even had to submit an app, but um, as a result, Somebody told them they had to, and and so I guess I I would want to support them. I don't even think I can make a motion, but Bill, I'm baffled too, and I don't think that I want to make a motion to approve or deny because I'm too baffled by the application to come to that conclusion. And I would okay. like you to follow up with Andrew to find out why they had to make the application because this is just you know yeah we should uh, why, not make citizens jump through hoops if they don't need to. Yeah, uh, why don't I do that? And I'll let him know that we did not receive anything but questions, no opposition. And so, you know, 
we shouldn't even have to support this, but, oh, and I think I just saw a chat come in. You, you have a couple three or four comments in chat. Okay. Yes, okay. Um, can I make a motion that the county explain why the application was required? Do I understand correctly that you've been accused as to why the county would require this? Recommend that we let the county know we didn't make a motion. Okay, you know what? I'm just, um, I will not only email, but I'll talk with Andrew and just let him know all of that. Cause I, I am very curious, as you all are. So I'll report back next month <laughs> on my to-do list. All right, let's move along. Tammy, quick question oh, here. Yes. Um, Amy making a, a motion in the chat. Does that need to be addressed? Um, was it a motion or was it a uh it was a request to make a motion oh can i make a motion um well i i think that would really lend itself more to would you please a request more than a motion gotcha. I mean, okay. we can go down that road but i don't i mean as much as motions take i promise you i will get this done by tomorrow so and andrew is waiting for us so he'll be looking for the email soon but I'll get back to you, promise you next month, and maybe even via email. Okay, let's keep moving along. Our last one isn't actually for our, well, it is in our area, but this is from the city of Oregon City. If we can all picture the original old school bus barn area, there off of you go Beaver Creek to Maple Lane and Maple Lane to go to Maple Lane Court. And that's where all the buses were parked up there. And now they've got like, RV and boat storage, or oh, and Jess is going to put a map up. Okay, so that area is slated to be developed, and my understanding that it, it will be de developed in some apartments, um, some office, some commercial office buildings, a rehabilitation, and I'm working off of memory from an application we received from the city of Oregon City at least two years ago. So this application is, is not very technical from, as you can see on the screen, kind of that red dot. And I, if you can make your mouse, that's it. Okay, from that area, uh, straight south is Newell Creek. You can see the little line of Newell Creek there. So the request is the applicant is proposing to construct a stormwater pipe connecting the multifamily development to an outfall into Newell Creek near Beaver Creek Road. The improvement satisfies a condition of approval and then there's a bunch of numbers. So as a part of their development, they're being required to obviously deal with stormwater. Um, our board you know, meets a week before uh, this community meeting and when it was brought up at our board meeting, you know, I think we can all be concerned that, that you know, Newell Creek feeds Abernathy Abernathy feeds Clackamas River, and that's our pure water, amazing. Am I wrong? Uh-oh. Abernathy goes directly into the Willamette. It is oh. uh, absolutely pure stream right to the Willamette, and anything that goes into Abernathy goes into the Willamette. Okay. Thank you, Bill. I thought it went into Clackamas. Thank you very much. So, um, you know, they, they have to do this if they're going to develop it, but there's nothing in here that talks about assuring that stormwater runoff, which can be from parking lots and rooftops and can have some chemicals and oils and things of that nature. I wanna make sure that this runoff is uh, clean before it enters. So what our board recommended, but of course I wanted to bring it here so our citizens could talk about it, is maybe a letter to Oregon City that would talk about um, requesting to make sure that this stormwater is environmentally safe. I know you have a lot of experience with this, Mark. Is there, oh, good. I just saw your hand go up. Do you want to talk about this? Yeah, that I would like to, personally, I'd like to see the environmental impact that if they even did a study on that, because Newell Creek is notorious for landslides. And if they're adding an additional water flow that's not being absorbed into the ground but is being run off of those areas like you said asphalt and everything else and going and then dumping into Newell Creek which will have some erosion issues if you're adding this kind of water flow to it so do they have an impact study are they going to be doing some retention ponds or something else that will help both clean 
help with the absorption into the soils and what kind of catch basins they're going to be putting in place that will help with the uh, uh, potential contaminations holding back so they can be siphoned off and, and, and put in to recycle if that they're still doing that. Um, so those would be my points to put forth to the city okay. for our concerns. Yes, I, I think that's fabulous. We have until March 29th to submit a letter and we can do that via email directly to Christina who is the uh, uh, um, planner. Um, I will make an attempt to draft this because this is gonna be complicated. Mark, can I run it by you to fix it? <laughs> Unless, yes. uh, Jessica, do you wanna take a stab at this or would you like me to take a stab at it? Um. Please take a stab at it. Okay, thank you. No problem. I mean, only because I have some history with it and then I can work with Mark directly. And, and then of course, we'll have our response and we'll share that with the board. And we can also share that with our citizens. So on our website. All right, uh, any other recommendations? I think Mark really captured it, but we will be sure to get all of that in a letter to the city. Anything else that someone would like for us to include in that response? There's a comment in the chat from Dirk. Wonder. Jessica, thank you. We had discussions, but I can't recall what requirements there were. As far as I can remember, they seemed minimal. Oh, Dirk. Okay, great. Okay, Dirk, Dirk good. Well, we'll, um, uh, Bill, can we, can if, when we do a response, can we put that on our website? Here was our response. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. well, one way or another, we'll get it out there and show everybody. All right, I'm going to move along. Uh, we had three, actually five decisions that came through. Uh, one was the um, the mobile dental office above the garage, which is was approved subject to conditions. The um, event center on Kirk Road, the hearings officer denied that application. I want to thank uh, Mark Hilliard for all the time and effort that he put into that and um, his newfound goal of reuniting the, com the community in that area, a very honorable goal. And then also we had another land use, um, the home occupation for a small processing lab to create lavender oil, I think, or lavender byproducts. And that was approved subject to condition. And then we just got the big official from the Board of County Commissioners that denied the, um, Oh, say it. Hold on, it's right here. Um, Addiction Recovery Center out on Lower Highland. We just received like the official verbiage on that. And then also the Board of County Commissioners official removing decision to remove the historic overlay on the property north of Wilson and east of Beaver Creek, that 25 acres, if I remember correctly. So yes, all of those decisions came in. That was a lot of activities, so thank you all for providing input. Reports, Cheryl, on our agenda is our treasurer's report. Would you like to add anything or make a comment? I have nothing to add. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that report. Uh, Bill, I had you down for a few things. Uh, if you wanted to speak toward transportation or anything new and exciting with Beaver Creek Cooperative Telephone, and then also to bring up a website expense that we might, the board may need to talk about this evening. So it's all yours. Okay. So first off on transportation, the uh, region one area council on transportation on which I sit will be meeting on April 4th, I think, um, sometime in early April. And we'll be going over things that are happening region wide the region includes Multnomah County, parts of Washington County, all of Clackamas County, and all of Hood River County. Um, and most of what we're talking about is tolling. As I reported to uh, the board and I report again, uh, the R1 Act had set up a subgroup on tolling, and I was part of that uh, because we thought that tolling was not being handled quite right by uh, ODOT. And uh, ODOT has come back with the idea of, yes, you're absolutely right. We weren't handling it right. We need to make it bigger. So they're going to have a, uh, another committee 
forming of which I hope to be a part of. I don't know yet, we'll see what happens. I will fight to be a part of it because I'm the only person on the R1 Act that represents rural citizens directly. I mean, of course, all of the county commissioners represent the citizens that are their constituents, but I'm the only one who directly represents rural concerns. So I will fight to be on that uh, committee. Clearly, when ODOT found that all of the Clackamas County Commissioners were not in favor of tolling, they had to rethink their forward drive on putting tolling on that small section of uh, 205 that was the Abernathy Bridge and uh, parts uh, slightly west. So we have a new committee. We haven't met yet. Uh, we will be following what's happening with tolling. And I certainly am personally not in favor of tolling. I have an open mind. I think tolling may be a practical solution for the region, but it has to be implemented region-wide rather than just in Clackamas County, uh, where we only have four ways to get across the uh, Willamette River, and one of them is the ferry. So I'm, I'm deeply involved in transportation, and I will continue to make sure that the rural voice is heard. I mean, there's a, people think that rural means there's nothing happening out here. But here's where we grow the trees. Here's where we grow the crops. We have to have good transportation to get all of our stuff to all of the people who need our stuff. So I'm, I'm deeply involved in transportation. I will continue to be uh, involved with that. Okay, for BCT, as most of you know, we are stopping our cable TV offering at the end of the month. If you didn't know that, please call, call BCT and figure out what you wanna do about that because you're not gonna have cable TV after the end of the month. We are doing other things to help improve that. We are having, we have um, uh, several different internet options that can increase your speed and make streaming better than you may have right now. Um, we also have partnered with uh, some satellite providers. If you really want cable TV kind of TV, uh, we are offering uh, solutions through uh, several different cable, uh, I mean, sorry, not cable, satellite providers. Um, the good part about this whole thing is that we will have more bandwidth on the coax network um, to expand speeds for everybody. Right now we're offering up to 100 megabit service, which is pretty good uh, in some areas, but we want to be able to uh, offer that in more areas. And to do that, we have to get the TV off of the coax so that we can use that bandwidth to increase speeds to the rest of everybody else. Um, Let's see, what else do I want to say about BCT? We are actively looking at um, implementing a plan for fiber throughout Beaver Creek. And fiber means really high speed internet to everybody. Uh, so that's, that's a goal that's still, we're working on that. We haven't got uh, the loan for it, but with all of the federal money that's coming in uh, for infrastructure, uh, telecommunications is infrastructure. It's recognized that people in rural areas need high-speed uh, communications, just like the people in the cities. So we're still working on that. Uh, the future looks bright, fairly bright anyway. And the website expense that, that Tammy uh, alluded to, we have been having a, a really low, uh, volume personal website, which wasn't very capable. But now that with it, we have a, a media person to help us do things better. We're realizing that we really need to do something more than what we have been doing. And to do that, we have to upgrade our program. Right now we have a personal program. We need to upgrade to a business program. And with a business program, we can do oh, just tons more stuff and have a much more active and interactive kind of website that looks prettier, that has more information. And just, I mean, it, it, it's like two steps up. But the 
cost of that is a cost. It's uh, right now we're paying um, $48 a year for our website, which is really cheap. But to have a business account would cost $300. So I would like to ask the board to consider uh, increasing the uh, amount that we can spend on the Hamlet of Beaver Creek website to $300 from our current $50. And I would like to make a note that I always was curious why Stafford Hamlet pays up $300 for their website. <laughs> So now I know their website is way more interactive than ours was, but will soon be very interactive if we get this right. um, bit, you know, upgraded, which uh, Diana and Bill have been working like crazy people this week, um, getting that the website more user friendly, more, and that's why these bugs are starting to jump out. We don't have the capability to do things we really need to. So and there's there was there's just lots of little things that we aren't capable of doing right now. That if we upgrade our subscription plan, we will be able to do that. So, and Joe's okay. hand is up. I'd like to make a motion that we raise our. Um, the amount allocated per year to $300 for our website. Great. And do we Thank have a you. second? Thank you, Joe. I'll second it. I mean, right. I'm happy to do that because this will really improve the quality of our website and make everything that we do easier and prettier too. I mean, we don't have a pretty website right now. It's functional, but it's not pretty. It's not easy to use. There are so many things that we can improve with this. So I second the emotion. Uh, the emotion. <laughs> the, I second the emotion. I second the motion wholeheartedly. And, it, and it, just as a reminder, Melissa, um, um, come on. You, why do I want to say Yoder? Melissa Logan created it. And, and this was the way you did it. You started with a personal. And quite frankly, I think she paid for it and won't let us or hasn't let us pay her back. So uh, last year, but. Um, anyway, I, unless there's any further discussion, and I don't see any hands up, uh, would you just raise your hand if you are in support of the motion? Unanimous. Very good. Okay, Bill, thank you so much for bringing that up. Uh, will you let Diana know or, oh, and Cheryl has a question. Bill, could we, um, you, you, <laughs> um, we, should get that billing to us so that Melissa's not paying for this. Is that something that's doable? Well, it, it's a little complicated because Melissa uh, created the website and bought the website for us. We have to have Melissa release the website to us. Oh, okay. And then um, we can, can upgrade. Okay. But it, it's something that's doable and we will definitely have the bill come to the Hamlet of Beaver Creek uh, to your attention okay. rather than okay. Melissa's. That'd be Thanks. great. Bill, do you want to reach out to Melissa or shall I? I will uh, try to contact Melissa okay. and I may call on you to help. Okay. And I can uh, send you that email address as well. Wonderful. Thank you, board, very, very much. I think this is a super wise decision. And I've already seen lots of changes on the website it's still the same picture and everything but words are starting to change and it's becoming a little bit easier to manipulate so i'm pretty excited okay thank you bill anything else you wanted to add uh no i'm just excited to move the website into the uh 2020s rather than the 2015s oh good 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 yay thank you bill appreciate all your work on that um, all right, uh, Mark Hilliard and Cindy uh, Parks, and I think we have a picture we might want to put up. <laughs> Jessica, <laughs> panic look. <laughs> Would you like to talk about the parks, Mark? Sure. I've got Cindy trying to hide. <laughs> I don't. Oh. Off. <laughs> but uh, as you can see, uh, as you drive by, the park has been uh, redecorated for the upcoming Easter. That, that we're going to be having on uh, Saturday, April 16th. April 16th. There's a picture. I, I love that picture with the sunset right behind it. It's That's really beautiful. cool. And those lights are interactive. 
Uh, we're also putting together and uh, working in collaboration with the, the cafe, and uh, we have a realtor as a sponsor as well to uh, help us put on the Easter egg hunt that we'll be having uh, on that date about 11 o'clock in the morning. And that will be broken into uh, two groups of uh, youth that I believe is- uh, Zero to six and six to 12 year old. So, um, and that's just start of the, the beginning of getting the park active with the community. Wonderful. Hey, Jess, do you happen to have a copy of that flyer? I know we had it maybe at the board meeting, but I don't remember. Yeah, she's grabbing that. Great. Uh, wonderful. And I mean, it's the Hamlet as well, mainly the restaurant, I think is funding that. Were, were there any requests besides we're going to have a booth there selling some of our Hamlet wares uh, and answering any questions and providing some literature? Anything else? Any other kind of support you or uh, Barb or Cindy Mead? We, we're going to sit down this weekend and, and figure out, because we're going to have to stuff some eggs. We're going to have to lay some eggs out. We're going to get some little games put together for after the egg hunt for the kids. So we'll figure out what we need for support there. Wonderful. We'll put out the request once the, it's all brainstormed a little bit more. Great. Who's the Easter Bunny? Uh, Crystal's brother-in-law. Wonderful. Oh, that's we're, also work, we're also working on putting some raffle baskets together. Uh, hopefully we'll have those together beginning of next week. They'll be up the saloon. They'll be selling raffle tickets. We'll have raffle tickets the day of the event. Um, <laughs> maybe we'll get Patrick to come draw the tickets. Awesome. Perfect. How exciting, absolutely wonderful. It's so exciting to drive by the park and see all the activity going on and, and the Easter egg hunt will be just a hoot. So we're putting one on up here, my ranch. And so I don't get to join in, but maybe next year, that's just neat. I do believe Cheryl and Jessica will be at the Hamlet booth, um, just answering questions. And we've got some things we might sell. And so you'll see us there. Awesome. Mark and Cindy, thank you. Anything else on parks you want to report tonight? Well, we do have the maintenance uh, crews starting as, uh, as of today, they started mowing to try okay. and keep the park in good condition, especially for the upcoming event. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to keep that rolling along and we'll be reaching out to the community for that too. Excellent. I think your cat's ignoring us. <laughs> <laughs> There's a few of them doing that. Oh, man. All righty. Uh, thank you, both of you, very, very much. This is, you're getting, I, I hear on both Beaver Creek Forum and the Hamlet of Beaver Creek Facebook websites, you're sure getting lots of attention and kudos. So it's being noticed, and I'm thankful for that. All right, let's move along into old business. Um, Joe has, um, well, we're working toward getting a welcome to sign above the Hamlet of Beaver Creek signs in downtown. Any progress on that, Joe? Yeah, I talked to the guy that did the last one, and he's he's like, um, I think, 90-something years old, and he said it's not within his thing any longer. Didn't have a recommendation, but he said they did. Um, if he remembered correctly, they did it with chisels and I'm um, to make that. So, so if anybody knows anybody that can do some engraving and do a sign, um, we, we need help. Okay, it's a big cedar slab, and we need a welcome to, we can provide this, the software. Uh, Jessica. Is there still a sign on 213 that says, you know, expert carpenter needs work? Yeah. Yes. Is that the guy that you're talking about? No, no. I don't think no. so. <laughs> Just an idea. Yeah, well, we can always reach out and see if they'd like to do a little community service. Yeah. I, I, you know, we were thinking about buying a piece of cedar and we reached out on Facebook and somebody literally brought it to my house. So, mm -hmm. and donated it. I, you know, I, I really want to reach out. Mark, did you have someone? I thought someone might knew, know of someone. Mark has a hand up. Yeah, Mark. No, I, I don't know anybody particularly. Um, I'm going to rack my brain for the next couple of days to see if I do. Uh, one thing I did want to mention about the Easter, there is uh, going to be a spot where 
people, individuals, family can take a picture right down there at the, at the gazebo to, uh, that will have signage and, and Carla's put together uh, a, a array of both signage and hats and a few other things that, for the photo booth type of situation to help mem memorialize the activities going on. So just wanna make sure that that's gonna be seen as well. And hopefully we'll be doing the hashtag so that we can get a bunch of those pictures and put it up as well. So uh, yeah. there's, there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes to get some of that up there. So I wanna give Carla a thanks for that too. Huge shout out. Yes, you have quite the team. There's no question, that's great. How fun, yes. Well, and then after the event, it'll be nice to do a wrap up and you know who kind mm -hmm. of took care of what and uh, send out our shout outs to everybody. So let's plan on that for sure. Alrighty, so Joe, um, let's think about uh, again, reaching out right now, anybody that can engrave a big sign, we can also throw that on Facebook and see if we can pull somebody in. But if anyone knows of anybody, let me know, let Joe know, any of us. So anything mm -hmm. else on that sign? Um, other than that, there's just some touch up left for it and put the caps on, but we can't put the caps on until we get that last piece of wood up there. So we're just kind of on hold until we get that done. Perfect. Get it engraved, get the Perfect. engraving done. Then the painting. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> we know how to do it. Awesome. Yep. Thank you, Joe. That's just terrific. Um, new business. Uh, the agenda did not say that there was any, but we did get uh, a memo from Clackamas County. They will be holding a town hall, uh, not only, I think, in person, but also via Zoom. And just a second, I'm quickly thumbing through. The town hall is April 6th from 5.30 to 7 p.m., and the Board of County Commissioners will be discussing homelessness, supportive housing and housing affordability, land use, the local economy, economic development, public safety, mental health resources, treatment and addiction treatment, and transportation, all within an hour and a half. Wow, I need to take a lesson, <laughs> clearly. Uh, but you know, uh, I believe Bill will be putting it on our website, yes. It's so all there already. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, just love technology. So that was the new business we had. Um, Grange update, again, still having breakfast this is the first Saturday. And um, that is into June. They did have their St. Patrick's Day dinner and they had 72 people uh, participate. That's pretty crazy. That's wonderful. I'm really, you know, things are starting to build back up and people are participating. Uh, did you have a comment on that bill or were you talking I was, about- No, I was just going to make sure that you mentioned that they had a really great turnout and they were really happy. And we had the sign up at the corner park that may have driven a few more people there. I don't know, but uh, we fully support the Grange and how they support us. Oh, absolutely, great plug, I agree. And nothing new on the Planning Commission. I reported last month and nothing has changed. Our next meeting is a town hall. It's April 27th and again via Zoom. Our guest speakers, and I'm super excited about this. It's going, the topic is residential solar power. So if you've ever considered it, or if you've got your list of 20 questions, this is going to be the ninth. We've got Zach Snyder with Solar Energy slash Energy Trust of Oregon. So he's kind of representing the government or the PGE side of things. And that's going to be everything from batteries and stuff like that. Then we also have Zach Webb, who is a local um, contractor with energy solutions. So he's actually the guy that comes to your house with a clipboard and looks at everything and talks about whether you are a good candidate and what you might be able to produce. And so they're both, the Zach and Zach show, uh, very excited to come talk to us and get us all up to speed on residential solar. And that is what I have. Um, I'm not sure how I will work in um, homelessness speaker that night because it could be a really long night, but that seems to be the trend lately because we're pretty active these days. Um, and so that's it. I'm Before I adjourn, I wanna make sure if anybody wants to put their hand up, if they have a question or comment, Mark, I did send you an email. We forgot that new board members have to go through county education. <laughs> so 
it's all online. You click on it, you go through an education, then you have to let um, Katie or Stacy know that you've completed the education. And then you get to vote on things. So we kind of got things a little backwards, but I'm not seeing the sky falling, so I'm not too worried about it. But if you'll, if you'll go through that process, and none of us recently have done that, you might report in on how that educational process is. So, okay. Uh, the last time, <laughs> I went, oh. last time I went through that, it was in person with the uh, county council. So that was years ago. So yeah, we'll be interested in seeing how your, your training goes with the county. And I might mention to anybody who's listening, the reason that we have to do the training is all of the board members are agents of the county, which means when we're doing Hamlet business, we are doing business for the county. And so that's why we have to get training. We get training in open meeting laws. We get training in public meetings, all kinds of things that legal, legal stuff that we have to know about at least a little bit to be able to uh, be board members. Thank you, Bill. I always forget those very helpful explanations. Thank you for doing that. Okay, Amy, Athena, Barbara, mm -hmm. and Peter, Dave and Carla, and Dirk, and Jeff, thank you. Thank you so much for attending. We really appreciate you. And thank you, board. And Mark has a comment. Yeah, just uh, wanted to throw it out there. And also as a reminder, there's not much information yet, but on uh, Sunday the 3rd, the uh, cafe will be doing a bingo uh, that will be uh, for helping out with uh, Ukrainian issues that are going on there and, and help support. So put it out to the community. And I understand it's more than just bingo and, and putting funds together to send. Uh, they're going to be serving some Ukrainian fare, and yep. and um, I'm hoping they have some sort of a costume contest for the blue and yellow. That might be a fun thing, but that's super awesome. Uh, that what was that date again? I'm sorry. April third, Sunday. Right. Excellent. Okay. I don't know how they're going to pack up everybody in, but knowing Barb and Patrick, they will. All right, that's it. I am so sorry this meeting went so long, but I really appreciate our guest speaker. And uh, it's 9.03 and we're adjourning. So you can stop our recording, Jess. Good night, guests. Thank you for coming.